welcome to Success Redefined with Dr. Tony Warner. I'm Dr. Tony, mama five, psychotherapist, author, and mentor. Here, you're going to find insightful discussions spanning science, psychology, and soul as the personal and professional meet, and we explore the intersection of what really matters. So success can be redefined with connection, healing, and fulfillment in mind. This episode's theme of focus is on entrepreneurship. And I'll be joined today by D. Scott Smith, who's a business coach, and he's got degrees in business and behavioral sciences, which he brings to the work that he does. So we're going to have a candid conversation about how we can leverage the brain for more success in business and feeling more successful in life and how things like fear, joy, meaning, life pressures factor into it all. So let's go ahead and hop in. Hello, everyone. Today, I have a guest who brings a unique perspective to this conversation. So I'm very excited to dive in together. We're going to be talking about redefining success in entrepreneurship, but we're going to be talking about how to do that, leveraging the brain, right? So using the brain in business in a different way than maybe a lot of folks have considered. And my guest today is D. Scott Smith. Thank you <laughs> so much for being here with us today. Dr. Tony, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, using our brains in business seems like a good idea. And I love the introduction. I love this candid and courageous. Uh, I'm willing and able and happy to be candid and courageous with you today. Yes, yes. Thank you. I really think that we need more of it. I, I just mm -hmm. think we need more candid and courageous conversations in all walks of life. But come on, like in business too. Yeah. That's the area where oftentimes we try to keep it kind of sterile and it's missing something. It, mm -hmm. I, I just, I have found that it's missing something. So I appreciate that you're willing to be candid and courageous with us today. D. Scott Smith has a heart that rests with the solo entrepreneur and mm -hmm. small business owner. He has been in leadership roles in manufacturing, financial services, agriculture, nonprofits, and has even worked for himself for many years, for over 10 years, in fact. His undergraduate degree is in business and finance with a minor in behavior sciences. And him and his wife are approaching your 40 here? Absolutely. Yeah. Coming up in August, we'll have our 40th anniversary. Oh, that's yeah. so exciting. Happy early anniversary. Thank you. You are very welcome. <laughs> and you have three adopted children. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What are their ages? Yeah. So we've got uh, our, our son. He's the youngest at 21, 23, and 26 now. So nice. uh, moving right along. They sure do, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they just keep on growing. Nothing yeah. stops them. <laughs> D. Scott also, um, he became a board member for a nonprofit for the very first time when he was 25 years old. And you said you've been on a board ever since then, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just one of those things that I grew up with. My mother was very active, very involved. And it just seemed like that's what you did. And I'm always surprised when I talk to especially business leaders and they're not involved in nonprofit boards. So mm. anyway. To have some kind of involvement in the community. In fact, you, you said when one of the things that we do here on the show that makes us different is that we vet every single guest. We only want to mm -hmm. have guests on here that really truly have the heart and the passion that aligns with us. And so what you shared with me, D Scott, that really, <clears throat> stuck out to me. You said, I believe it's an important aspect of community to do things like serve on boards. I often end talks with this slide. It's not about making money. It's about living a life that makes a difference, mm -hmm. yeah, which can be a bold thing to say when it comes to business. Well, that's, to me, that's what it's about. It's not, uh, uh, there's a, there's a, a great line in, uh, in a movie that, that talks about this guy who, was made, who made a lot of money, but didn't really make an impact. And, uh, but the, but the people looking from the outside were looking at him as, as if the money was the success. And they said, well, he made a lot of money. This, the, the response was, 
It's easy to make a lot of money if all you want is to make a lot of money. Mm, I'm going to love this conversation. I can already tell. <laughs> but yes, I have so much to say about this. Um, but leaning into this, this theme of really leveraging neuroscience, leveraging mm -hmm. the way our brain wants to support us, the way our brain is functioning when it comes to business and being so bold as to bring this idea, this concept to the table that maybe the, you know, success isn't actually about just financial success, the numbers, the dollars. Maybe we can redefine success in a way that focuses on meaning, that, that focuses on feeling, experiencing a difference in your bones, in your soul, right? Like from the inside out. And I have a feeling that maybe we might be on similar pages about at mm -hmm. least some of this stuff. Sure. <laughs> How is this sitting for you so far? You know, I love it. And, and uh, we are a movie family. We, we love movies and we talk a lot in movies. That is, we quote them. And there's a great line. And my favorite movie actually is Wizard of Oz, the one I grew up with. And there's a great line when the wizard is getting ready to leave the Emerald City and he's giving his final greetings to each of the characters. And he comes to the Tin Man, right, who was so uh, desirous of a heart. And he tells that the wizard tells the Tin Man, and remember my sentimental friend, that a heart is not measured by how much you love, but by how much you are loved by others. Mm. Our heart. It's interesting. We forget about the heart mm. a lot. A lot. In my experience as an entrepreneur and as a therapist, it's always there mm -hmm. pumping so that our brain, our body, our full self can thrive, can can not just survive and live, but but thrive. And I think that there's so much power if we put that in perspective with what you just shared, mm -hmm. even if we try to apply it to business. Absolutely. Yeah. It's um, especially with small business, right? And, that, and again, as you mentioned, that's where my heart is. It's with the small business owners, uh, those solo entrepreneurs, the people who really add so much value and variety in the world. Um, big business will always be big business and it operates on a different level. And so we can't necessarily copy things that work for massive multinational corporations and try to scale it down, right? There's a difference when you get to the small business. And one of the things we love about going into that shop where people know who you are, they know what your preferences are, uh, they know about your family is that they're not operating on a large scale. They're, they're doing it because, yeah, we need to make money to feed our families, to, to uh, fulfill our responsibilities. But what we do brings joy into our lives. Mm. What we do brings joy into our lives. And that's why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. How does that joy component connect with neuroscience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's um, everything that we have within our bodies is such uh, an interconnected system. And it's very complicated. And it's not just one thing, right? It's not just having a gratitude journal is going to make your life better, right? But We've done research that says people who show gratitude are happier, right? These are, this is some research that we've done. One of the ones that I love is uh, I've got a picture here. This is out of our window uh, looking toward the river. We're fortunate we live uh, right near the Willamette River uh, here in, in Oregon in Independence. And people who see great moments in nature, right? Sunsets, sunrises, stand on the rim of the Grand Canyon, uh, watch the ocean. Uh, people that experience these uh, uh, events, these moments, 
this grand uh, beauty tend to be more philanthropic after having that experience. Mm. It's interesting. So my degrees are not in neuroscience, um, <clears throat> but as a, as a psychotherapist, I regularly keep up on the research of neuroscience because I integrate it into all of the work that I do um, in brain spotting and things, a variety of different work that I do as a psychotherapist. And, and so this is, this is a really uh, important topic to me because we, I think, try to view the brain, the body, the heart, just as these organs, just as mm -hmm. these things. But when we can conceptualize them and better understand how they're affecting our experience, right? The way that we feel and the way that we interact, I do think it directly ties into what we're talking about here of redefining success, no matter where we apply it, you know, be it in business or elsewhere. And so what I hear you saying when you say that is, you know, we're really helping wire the brain, helping to support our nervous system from this state of appreciation. And the more we do that by connecting with things like nature, the the, the more we do that, right? Like the more we practice it, right. the more we feel it, and then the more we benefit from it. And the more we do that, the more we can put out into the world from that place rather than from that place of, oh, if I just want to make more money, I'll make more money. I'll focus on making more money. Okay, we can make a lot of money. I've said before, <clears throat> and I bet you could chime in on this, do you have any idea how many wealthy or rich people mm -hmm are unsatisfied or unfulfilled in their lives. Yeah, it's interesting. There was, uh, so University of Texas at Austin, actually their marketing department uh, did some research and one of the lead professors there uh, wrote a book or at least co-authored a book. And the title of it is, uh, if you're wealthy, if you're so rich, something like, if you're wealthy or if you're so rich, why are you s not happy, right? And uh, we we tend to think that that these things will bring us what we want, but we don't actually know what we want, right? And so when we're looking for money, we're looking. What are we looking for? Probably security, right? Um, some sort of some sort of tangible security. Um, and we get mad when our children do things that put them in danger. We we. Re react, right? We don't respond. We react at that moment emotionally. And it may sound harsh because we're afraid that they're going to get hurt, right? We're not really mad at them. We're mad that what could have happened to them, right? These are, these are things that we, we're not looking at what really is the cause. Yeah. That, that fear reactionary place that we can come from, I think that, that connects with the conventional definition of success, right? Of if we, if we check all the boxes, if we do all the things, if we make all the money, if we hit all of the promotions, if we create a business that makes a lot of money, right? This is what's successful. And to not achieve those things or even to not pursue those things, there can be fear Mm -hmm. attached to that. And so it's like, well, we have to, we, we have to be moving in that direction. And you and I both know that when our brains, our bodies, our nervous systems are operating from a place of fear, whether we realize it or not, we are not in our best mental state of mind, right? We're not mm -hmm. able to think as clearly, as rationally, not able to connect as, as compassionately, not even as able to feel that joy and appreciation. Right. right, that you were saying nearly as deeply as we could and and still can. Yeah, and so this is one of the things. So we're, uh, I will say, we're now past the COVID uh, world problem, right? To to an extent, the COVID. It, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna affect us, but uh, um, but but a lot of it, uh, we're we're past the major parts of this, right? But um, back when the lockdowns first started happening, right? Some people woke up in the morning and they were told their business is no longer essential and they mm -hmm. can't work. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking, my family says it's essential. 
<laughs> you know, the, the mortgage company says it's essential. So uh, a lot of things happen. So when we lose things like our career and that's where identity is, that's a bad thing, right? Mm. And uh, so you take away from you take away from somebody that element of 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 their identity, and uh, it's just not good. But the story that I like to tell about this is uh, is Muhammad Ali, who was born Cassius Clay when he was a, a young man, a little like a junior high boy. Uh, some neighborhood kids stole his bike and the local sheriff said, you should learn uh, to defend yourself. So he signed up for a boxing class. 10 years later, he won a gold medal. And then uh, uh, shortly after that, uh, he won the world, a world title for boxing and professional boxing. Uh, meanwhile, he uh, converted to Islam, changed his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali. And a lot of people think that the reason that he had his license taken away from him to box professionally, that his career, his means of supporting his family was taken away from him, was because he was a conscious, conscientious objector and didn't uh, submit to the draft into the U.S. military. But the reason they took his, his license to box was because of his conversion to Islam. Hmm. But the interesting thing was that even though his, his uh, identity right, was taken away from him, his career was taken away from him, because he's world champion, he's a gold medal winner, but he, he saw that that was not his identity. His identity was, was sharing the need for uh, racial equality in, in, uh, in the United States specifically, right? Yeah. In a pre-civil rights uh, United States in the 60s. Uh, Ten years later, he got his license back to box. But he continued during that time when he could not uh, fight professionally. He continued to go to college campuses and share the message. So he was able to to really fulfill what he saw as his meaning and purpose. And that's what we're really looking for. What's your meaning and purpose? Yeah, I, I did not know, you know, that that history there, but. I do I, I, that that meaning that that purpose that ultimately we we all want to experience um, it can get misplaced right we can we can we can think that it's money as you were saying we can think that it's in the awards or the accomplishments but when it comes to business, I think the question that a lot of business question, a lot of business owners may be asking, is, yeah, that's all well and good, Scott, right? But uh, if I'm not running a profitable business, mm -hmm. why does that? Why does any really anything else matter if I can't take care of my bills or my family or my home or X, Y, or Z? And I've heard that before, but I'm curious about what your what your response is from someone who's in that place, who who may even be tuning and listening right now. What is what is the connector there that mm -hmm. you have found to be helpful for them? <laughs> yeah, um, there's always challenges, right? We need to we need to make money, and you know, I said that. Just like you woke up in the morning and COVID said, uh, the response to COVID said, uh, your job is no longer essential. Uh, and you're thinking, well, how am I going to take care of my family? So there are things over which we have no control, right? But uh, w I truly believe that within each threat is an opportunity. And this is the benefit of being a small business, of being a solo entrepreneur, is that you can make changes very quickly. You can adapt quickly. So just to go back onto the COVID response, one of the things was that um, a friend of mine, his parents owned a business that made money by selling lab supplies to uh, 
labs in on college campuses. And they did it through trade shows. So they do these mini trade shows. They go to the college campus, bring in the vendors, people, would, uh, the uh, lab personnel would come out, buy the stuff and go back, right? It was very efficient. Well, COVID came and it, it canceled all of those on-campus uh, visits. And so a friend of mine calls up and says, my parents are going to lose their business. Do you know anything about virtual trade shows? Well, I had a friend that had been doing it for a number of years before that. So uh, I call him up. The three of us get together and we were able to help his uh, parents out. But also we created something completely new. We, we started doing specifically online fundraisers for nonprofit businesses or organizations. So the lockdown was in March of 2020. By April, mid-April, uh, we had a contract with a nonprofit organization in Manhattan to do a online fundraiser, a live fundraiser for them. And then we ended up doing uh, fundraisers and uh, tr uh, conferences for the next two years, completely out of a, a response to a, a significant threat to business. But we were able to do it quickly because we're small business. We're solo entrepreneurs. We're able to find the opportunity and then find a solution to it and make it happen. Hmm. So for the, the business owner who is trying to connect these dots from mm -hmm. this conversation we're having here, or are you saying that there is an opportunity to get creative mm -hmm. and still make an, make an impact and an income um, that is able to be utilized through through like our the how we're leveraging something inside of us our, our brain our, our neuroscience how is that is there a connection with with that opportunity being present in a threat the story that you just told with with the the neuroscience behind that so the so the basic part of this is is housed in the amygdala right the the typically referred to as fight or flight, but it's also fight, flight, or freeze, right? And so uh, when COVID happened, uh, we saw people uh, fight. That is, they were posting and, and lashing out and saying, uh, the government and big organizations are doing too much or they're not doing enough, right? Fight, fight, fight. And then we saw other people who uh, were posting out uh, should I get a Disney Plus subscription? Is it worth it? Because they were just running to entertainment, right? They were running away from the problem. Uh, and then we saw a lot of people do nothing. I literally saw signs on a business uh, when the sh uh, shutdowns happened that said, we'll see you in two weeks. They took it like a family vacation. Uh, and they were just trying to operate under the same premise that they had before. That is, uh, when you're a small business, you don't want to make a mistake, right? Because you don't have a lot of resources to back up, right? If you make a mistake, then you could lose the business. So uh, when challenges, when threats happen, uh, the amygdala kicks in and we either uh, fight, run, or do nothing. And uh, I believe that that third one is the most dangerous. It is being stagnant and not looking. What is it that, is giving me an opportunity, right? So this is this is one of the things that we can use the brain to help understand why, why we do what we do. Hmm. So for anyone that was, was or is having a hard time um, feeling successful in business, how what would you say, how would you recommend them use knowledge of, of the brain of neuroscience, help them to feel more successful and move forward mm -hmm. rather than kind of stay stuck in a stress response. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I do on a, on a daily basis is I have, um, so I, I created a, my own planner because I didn't like what was out there. Um, I wanted some specific things 
to help me track my goals on a daily basis, right? So uh, assuming that we've got goals and plans to meet those, right? And that's a whole different conversation. But let's just say I've got the goals and I look at my calendar for today and I say, oh, I'm going to be recording with Dr. Tony. This is very cool. And what goal does that relate to? Oh, that go that's good. That's uh, sharing information about my business and about how I can work with people. So that matches up to a goal. So I put that onto my daily goal tracker. Uh, and it's one thing to put that onto the tracker, but it's another thing to actually do it, right? So, uh, but now that we've had this conversation, I can go in, I, I can basically check that off, right? But I know that it's tied to a goal. I have exercise on my calendar. That's great. But Scott, did you do it? If not, then I look at that blank spot on my calendar that said exercise, but nothing colored in next to it. Um, but when I do, then I get to check that off. That fires off the dopamine in the brain that says, you know, I'm happy and I want to do that again. So setting up very simple ways to give yourself a daily reward is one way to, to leverage the brain science to make you better at what you do, right? So uh, maybe it's the way you greet people on the phone or uh, handle an email, or there's a lot of different simple tasks that we do every day that you can look at and you can say, which one of these are going to help me trigger off the dopamine of my brain by being successful at it? And then set up a system to track it so that when you do it, boom, it fires off and you want to do it again. Mm. In psychology, we call that positive reinforcement. And there's a variety of different uh, ways that we can positively reinforce, you know, thoughts, mm -hmm. actions that we want to, to repeat. I'm curious, <clears throat> Scott, if we take a step back mm -hmm. and look at you and your story and what has cultivated your heart, your passion for the business that you now run, mm -hmm. how would you say you viewed success before or defined success earlier in your career? How would you say you thought of success then versus now? Yeah, it's interesting. It was, um, uh, I remember uh, I started college, ran out of money, joined the Air Force, and got out of the Air Force and uh, got married and went back to college. And at the at the time, I remember actually literally writing in my journal that uh, a man's, you know, they say a man's home is his castle, right? It's kind of the old school. And I had written that a man's home is his uh, corporate headquarters, mm. right? So for me, it was uh, go to business school, graduate, go to work for a large corporation and get a big office at the top of some tall building. Right. And I was on that path. And I remember, uh, shortly out of college within a year, I'm in this, uh, management training program with, uh, this big bank. Uh, the first event that we did was have lunch with the president in the boardroom. And I'm thinking, look, I, I'm here. Here's the president executive vice president, regional vice presidents, me and my peers. And all of this is designed to put me at the top of this tall building, right? Uh, after about a year, I realized I didn't like any of those people. Yeah. Um, and it was their lifestyle, right? Uh, as we mentioned early on that my wife and I are celebrating 40 years of marriage this this very year in August, not one of those people in that boardroom was married to the same person they started with, which is not a, a knock on divorce or anything like that. I'm just saying that um, I didn't like the particular lifestyle that they were living and the, what it was doing to their relationships, right? Mm. And and so, um, I stepped away from that and said, this is not, I thought I wanted to work at the top of a tall building and have a big office and views out there and the, and the mountains and the oceans and 
and have all these people working for me. I thought that's what I wanted until I got into it. And what I really realized is that I want to have an impact on people's lives. Mm. And uh, so in uh, the, in, in one of the books I published, I wrote a, a part in there that talks about actually using an- another movie, uh, but basically saying that um, our greatest fear is, is not pain or suffering. This is my perspective. Our greatest fear is not pain or suffering, but it's irrelevance, mm. right? It's um, getting to the end of our life and looking back and saying, uh, and quoting from this movie, uh, for all the creation or destruction that your life uh, could have accomplished, you may as well have never lived at all. Mm. That's the worst. Mm. There's this lack of meaning, this lack of fulfillment, this lack of connection, this lack of satisfaction that can happen if we are defining success based off of like you said, right? Getting to this this part of my career, hitting this particular level in the tower, getting this particular outward thing, right? So the 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 corner office, the the sign on bonus, the whatever it is. <clears throat> there's there's something missing. There's there's a a piece that doesn't mm-hmm. connect right. for us inside that says well, this isn't, this isn't really all that meaningful. This isn't really all that fulfilling or satisfying. And so there must be something else to reach for, to work towards, to prove yourself about, right? Like, and so you just keep reaching and going and you could just go like that forever and just burn it, burn out and be unsatisfied and unfulfilled. Is that kind of along the lines of what you're saying? Absolutely. And we see that all the time, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's famous in Hollywood because those are the people that are Uh, in the news all the time. And Mm. it's just like, um, I can only live in one house at a time. I can only sleep in one bed. I can only eat one meal at a time. Right. And so what it comes down to is, is really defining uh, what, what do I need? Right. What do I need? What do I need? And, and, and I don't think just to kind of clarify what I had said earlier as well, that's connecting with what you're sharing I don't think there's anything bad or wrong about wanting to make money, right? Like there's nothing bad or wrong about wanting to make money. There's nothing bad or wrong about having financial goals. There's nothing bad or wrong about wanting to have money in the, in the bank that, that um, kind of a cushion, so to speak. There's nothing wrong at all with any of that at all, right? Absolutely. As you said several times, Scott, you know, businesses, yes, they need to be profitable. They need, they need to be make money. That's part of their function. However, We as individuals are social emotional beings. In fact, that is how our brains get shaped, right? Besides genetics, our brains are shaped by the interactions we have, the emotions that are firing and wiring at any given point in time. That's how our brains, our our nervous systems get get molded, shifted, wired. Mm -hmm. So we need to keep that in mind. But It's so interesting because when it comes to defining success, especially I have found like in the earlier parts of our careers, um, somehow that gets taken out of the equation. (laughs) It's like, no, like almost be robotic, right? Like learn how to do these things and hit these things. And then if you do that and you prove yourself and you push yourself hard enough, um, then you'll see the success you'll have earned it. Right. right. There's like the <laughs> deservingness to it. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, you gotta, and, and is that something that you have experienced? Yeah. I just, I was thinking back to uh, my microeconomics professor, Dr. Thomas Bible. And he said, I don't like money, but I do like what money can do. Mm. Right. And so this is again, what we're looking at going, but what is it that we're trying to accomplish? Mm-hmm. Right. So, uh, getting a big retirement account. Why? Right. What are you, what are you trying to do? Um, if you're trying to grow your business, right. One of the things that I love about small business is that it creates jobs because not everybody should be an entrepreneur. Not everybody can start a business. Not everybody should lead a business, right? There are plenty of folks that, 
um, are just happy to come in, do a good job, get a paycheck and go home and do whatever it is they do, right? Take care of their family, have their hobbies, do the things that they do. Um, but that's what, that's what businesses do, right? But you can't create jobs if you're not running a profitable business, if you're not making those changes, right? And, and so this is, uh, to me, it's, it's goes hand in hand. Uh, one of the things that I've done uh, over the years was, was, uh, and it's been nine years on our local chamber of commerce. And one of the things we did was, was, um, help create the vision for the chamber. So for our local chamber. And one of the things that I saw was that as a, as the purpose, the top line function of the chamber of commerce was that it was the only place in the universe that business nonprofits and government came together and sat at the same table with the same goal. That is to make this a good community. But each person, each group had their own role, right? Businesses creating jobs, bringing in uh, money that can be given to the nonprofits, right? To, to do things that uh, you, that you just can't make money at, right? That need that out, outside support and the government creating the infrastructure and the services that we need uh, within our community. But if we can all come together and do what we do, that's, this, this is what's important. And small business is a huge part of that. Mm. And what about that solo entrepreneur who's thinking right now, well, I don't, I can't employ someone and maybe I'm okay running a solo entrepreneur setup for, for at least for the foreseeable future. What might you speak to or speak towards for them to help them with that connection? <laughs> it was funny because a friend of mine was running a business. He's, you know, he sells a, a, a product, a, a thermostat cover, and it's in Home Depot and Lowe's and, you know, different stores and, and things like that. And, but it's a struggle to sell these and mm-hmm. he's working and he's, selling, but it's just him, right? He's, he's doing this and, and uh, working with these different vendors and bringing the products in and making the phone calls and getting them distributed out. Um, and he doesn't have any employees and there's no uh, plan to bring employees into his company, but he was doing pretty good. They were making money and he wanted to hire someone to come in and clean his house a couple of times a week or whatever it was. Right. Um, and he was kind of embarrassed, right? Mm. Shouldn't this be something that I do? I mean, this is just, you know, it's dusting and vacuuming, right? Can't I do that? Can my wife and I do that and our kids? But, uh, we had the conversation and said, look, David, here's the deal. If you called me up and said, and you're all excited because you said, hey, I hired a part-time employee to help me do this stuff. Wow, congratulations, your business is growing. But you just told me that you hired uh, a part-time employees, if you will, right? Contracted with a company to come in and do work because of the result of the success of your business, right? So why would you be ashamed of that? Because you're creating employment for people. So even as a solo entrepreneur, entrepreneur, you may not have employees, but as your business grows and becomes more successful, you're working with artists, right? You're working with web designers. You're uh, getting printing done at the local uh, print shop, right? You're creating an event and getting it catered from your local caterer, right? These are... Uh, those are all positive impacts that you're having because your business is successful. You may not be hiring employees, but you're creating economic growth in your neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Ways to contribute, mm-hmm. right? opportunities for different ways to contribute. So when you say your business is successful um, in this particular example, it sounds like you're talking about financially successful, and then the the contributions are coming as that overflow. Or well, would you need to alter that at all? Yeah. So that so again, it, it comes down to, but what is it that you do, right? Um, you don't make money, 
is, as uh, Simon Sinek says, uh, money is just a result, right? Mm -hmm. It's a result of what you do. And so what we want to do, and, you know, I, I teach people about business networking. And the first thing that I say is, look, you already have a fabulous network filled with remarkable people who want you to be successful. They just need to know what problem you solve and who is your ideal customer, right? So whatever your business is, it solves a problem. Somebody has a problem. They need help. They need a solution to that. And that's you, right? So what you're doing is you're solving a problem. The coffee shop uh, right on the corner here, uh, they serve coffee. That's a need. I want coffee. I'm willing to pay three and a half bucks for a cup of coffee, right? That's that's the the transition, the transaction, right? And uh, whatever problem it is that you solve, as long as the pain is greater than the cost of your service, you're going to sell a lot of your solution. But that's what you have to understand. This is like, what's the problem that they solve? And what's the cost that people are having to experience when they experience that problem? What are they willing to pay to get rid of it? And so if someone puts kind of all their eggs in one basket and they're, they're like shaking their head. Yes. And what you're saying. And, and they're like, yes, yeah, so I need to do this. My business needs to make money. And they kind of throw everything at it. Where would you say then runs the risk of feeling successful with other parts of their life and how to navigate that? Uh, so uh, I guess I want to have you restate that a little bit. Yes. So I'm a business, so I am a business owner, but yeah. I'm going to speak hypothetically, right? So I'm a business owner and I'm like, yes, yes. All right. I need to do exactly what Scott's saying right now. Like I'm going to just put everything that, say this is my interpretation. I'm going to put everything towards my business because my business needs to be successful. And successful means that it's making money because making money then allows me to go out and to contribute in the world in these ways. So I'm going to focus on this. And I've seen people do this, right? And perhaps you have as well. But they become then hyper-focused on that because that now becomes their version, their definition of success. And it gets their energy and their effort. It gets their everything, right? Mm -hmm. But they're business people, right? So there's other parts of their lives besides just business. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've seen this happen time and time again, which is why I think it's a really important part of this conversation. Like it, if we're only talking about um, business success as, as the profit and even the contribution that comes through the business, both of which are important, we can, we can sometimes forget as business owners that that's not, that's still my challenge is that is not success. If we're looking at feeling successful in life, Right beyond just the business. So is it enough if we look, like you said, at Hollywood? We're looking at the folks in Hollywood. Yes, they have the money. They have the reputation. They have met their professional goals. They did that. And they can even contribute. Many of them are, are philanthropists, right? They can even contribute. But there's still this lack of satisfaction, this lack of fulfillment mm -hmm. that exists because all of the eggs were put in one basket, so to speak. This makes that perfect sense. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I understand this. It was a friend of mine, Scott Weaver, uh, his business, The Rise to Live and the Rise to Live podcast. Uh, one of the things he talks about is, is we're not talking about work-life balance. We're talking about work-life integration, right? There is no separation because we talked about this identity that we have uh, within what we do. And that's, it's not a bad thing, right? Um, but if you have a successful business, and your family falls apart. So I was in a, a mastermind with uh, Aaron Walker, and uh, he uh, he says um, he did that right. He focused on his business, and he said, "I came home with a pocket full of money to a house full of strangers." Right. So uh, as Scott, we were saying, "Great, you have a very successful business, but you have no family. So uh, now you're not. You know, then there's no reason for the business." because you have nothing to support. Uh, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, if you have no business, if you're going bankrupt, uh, you can't take care of your family and your family is going to fall apart is, again, right? 
And so uh, it's not either or, it's an and, right? We got to use the right conjunction. It's and, right? And so you need to work on your business and your relationships. This is one of the reasons why uh, in, uh, so I just finished up with a three-year plan and have developed uh, and still developing my next three-year plan. I believe in long-term planning, right? And uh, and you write, it, the way to do this, and this, everyone can do this today, do it right now, is write one sentence to say, who will I be in ex- each of these six areas, right? In your, in your per- personal life, your professional life, your personal relationships, your business relationships, your spiritual well-being, and your finances, right? That's the sixth area, which again is a result of the first five. So who do I want to be personally five years from now? Right. So maybe somebody wants to go to school and get a degree or a certificate, or they want to expand on a hobby or something, right? Something personal, some physical fitness goals that you have. These are typical things that you have on the personal basis, professional basis. Where do you want to be in your business? How many customers do you want to have? Do you want to have employees? Where do you, you know, define that, put that in one sentence. And what about your personal relationships, right? So I knew that three years ago, that coming into 2024 would be my 40th wedding anniversary. So I put things together that said, what, who do I want to be for that? And this is where you can be intentional. Take those six items, write one sentence for three years from now, 24, 25, 26, right? At, and when the year 2026 winds down, who, where do you want to be personal, professional, uh, relational business relationships, spiritual and financially. Right. Is that all of them? Yeah. <laughs> and so what would you say, Scott, helps you to stay consistent with that integration? What, what I call multifaceted. So here in this podcast, we really focus on the, the fact that we are all multifaceted beings. We have different roles. We have different identities. We have different um, things that we are living out in our lives. And we have, so we have many facets to us. And if we are neglecting, minimizing, or otherwise diminishing certain aspects of ourselves to, in order to feel outwardly successful in other areas, then is that really success? That's a big part of that challenge question here, right? Is how we're redefining success and why, like we need to ask ourselves that question. So yeah. What helps you embrace the multifacets of you? What helps you to stay consistent with integrating, as you said, that that work and life mm-hmm. piece? So the so having those having definition around those six aspects of my life, right, mm-hmm. is important, yes. and it gives you a long term goal. And again, I'm t- saying set this out for three years from now. Then when something comes along that's a short term. Uh, problem. It's not a roadblock. It's just a detour, right? So I have a long-term goal. Where am I going to be? Who am I going to be three years from now? And then uh, reflect on that occasionally. Set up a plan once a month, once a quarter, something to go through and review those. And I'm a a big advocate for daily journaling, right? Um, Whether you do it in the morning like I do, some people do it in the evening, midday, but set up a routine, right, that uh, sets you up for success in this area, right? And you don't have to be very verbose, right? This is the other thing, is that this is a time of reflection, not necessarily of putting ink on paper. So I was inspired by looking at some of the journals from settlers that were moving out west and, uh, or uh, on ships, right? And they keep a log, a daily log. And sometimes it said rained all day, right? That was their entry, not these paragraphs and pages and deep thoughts, but it was uh, something that they, uh, a routine they they were building into their life. And I encourage you, if, if you have a journal, then, and you use it every day and all you wrote is today's date, that's a good start. Tomorrow it rained all day. The next day, rained all day, looks like it's going to clear up. And then pretty soon you're going to say, uh, you're going to think, wow, today 
Yeah, and literally this morning I'm writing. I get to be on Dr. Tony's podcast today, right? I wrote that in my journal because I go, this is what I'm looking forward to. And you can think, what are we going to talk about? Oh, we're going to talk about the brain. We're going to talk about business, about defining success. These are things that are important, right? And so they're on my brain. Now I'm gearing up for the day. Or maybe you're a journaler at the end of the day and you wind down. Wow, what a great conversation with Dr. Tony today. Uh, we talked about the brain. We talked about how to define success. Um, what's the importance of looking at your your life uh, wholly and not just as an entrepreneur, not just as a uh, a personal relationship, but how do you link all of these things together and look at work life integration? Absolutely, and I love how one of my favorite words. Um, is intentionality, is, int mm -hmm. is the word intentional. So I love that you use that. And then you kind of went on to describe some of the ways that you practice that in, in your daily life of how you are being intentional with showing up for yourself, intentional with kind of carving, crafting, creating this future, you know, pathway mm -hmm. for yourself, not just in business, but as a whole being, because as a business owner, you are a person that is running the business, but we can't, I, we can't forget that we're the person, right? Like I just, I feel like I could scream it from the mountain. <laughs> Please do it. <laughs> leave the person out of the business, right? Like mm -hmm. these are people. Um, so I, I love that. I love that you're willing to share that. We're going to come with a, a closing question that I'm going to ask you. Mm -hmm. And then I know you have a gift to share about with our guests. So I'll, I'll share that with them. And then I'll invite you to also share ways that folks can connect with you if they want to follow up with you after the episode and things like that. Here's our question. Yeah. Now, looking back on the life that you've lived so far, reflecting on that, gathering even just from this conversation we've had, what would you say is your current redefined definition of success for yourself? Uh, current redefined definition success. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just going to go right back to having a plan, mm. right? And not short term, but long term. And long term in our life, I'm, I'm saying three years. You know, we can look out longer. Uh, there's too many variables. Uh, but setting defined places about who I want to be, not what I want to be, what I want to do, but who do I want to be three years from now is, is important mm. because it gives me, it gives me stability amid the storms. Stability amid the storms. Don't we all need that mm. right now? Won't we all benefit from that right now? Thank you so much for being being with us today, Scott. It's, it was My a honor. pleasure. And I think that we brought up some areas that we can all challenge ourselves in, in a good, positive, healthy way, uh, so that we can all move forward and grow as business owners and just as people. It's multifaceted beings who run businesses. And I know that you have a gift for our audience, you shared that you have a free cheat sheet. Can you tell them a little bit about your cheat sheet that you have about being successful in business? Yeah. So back in uh, 2016, I gave a talk at the Social Media Summit in Dublin, Ireland. And uh, the topic was the psychology and physiology of relationships. Now, remember, this is 2016. And uh, I used academic research and proved that the relationships that we create online digitally can be just as strong as those that we create face-to-face, -face, mm -hmm. right? And uh, then we went into a three-year laboratory in 2020 and proved that to be true, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we created some great relationships. Um, and so uh, part of that then is, is to define uh, what it means to connect with people, right? How do we do that? What happens? And so when we learn information, we, we, we use our prefrontal cortex, short-term memory, high energy. As you repeat things, it becomes hardwired into uh, the basal ganglia part of your brain. And so there's a reason why you can hop in the car uh, and you don't have to think about where you put the key, turn it, turn it to the right or the left, and you just drive and you show up where you're at. And uh, it's because it's all hardwired. You're working off a very uh, low energy part of your brain. The good part is that we, um, 
we can recall information very easily, right? But the downside is that we feel like everybody knows that. And mm. so in the cheat sheet, what we do is it, it just goes through six steps to tell people um, how to connect with people at events. And this works whether you're in person, which I'm grateful that we're back to, uh, or you do it online, which I love the efficiency of online <laughs> meetings, uh, being able to do that. So there's six steps that you go through. And part of that is taking, taking people on a conversational journey and reminding them how remarkable they are, because I yeah. guarantee you that the people that you meet have forgotten what it took to get to know what it is they do as an accountant or a plumber or a business owner, right? And when you take them on this conversational journey, you will remind them that people's lives are better because they do what they do. And, yeah. and that's what we do. So the six steps, it's very simple. You can go through uh, and learn that. Wonderful, wonderful. So if you want to check that out, I will have the link in the show notes. If anyone wants to connect with you, follow up with you, follow you in general in your work, where's the best place for them to find you? Yeah. So uh, LinkedIn is a great place, uh, but you can go to my website, dscottsmith.com and my links there to the socials, to, to LinkedIn, to uh, Instagram, whatever it is that works for you. Uh, my email, my phone number, whatever works for you is the way I want to connect. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us today, Scott, and for everyone else in the audience that have, have been with us today and shared your presence with us. We really appreciate it. So thank you for being here. If you're joining us from YouTube, I truly, truly, truly do invite you to share your questions, your comments, your reflections, all your contributions. Share them below in the comment section. It is a wonderful way to cultivate community here, to support one another, um, and also to continue to challenge one another, which I think we all benefit from in some way at different times in our lives. So thank you again. Much success to each and every single one of you. Until next time. Cheers. Links related to this episode can be found in the show notes section. Want to submit questions about success, satisfaction, healing, and relationships, health, or work? You can do that free and anonymous at drtonywarner.com, where you find other resources there as well. Did you benefit from this episode? You can subscribe, like, and share with another to pass it on because anyone can listen on the go with this podcast audio available on all major podcasting platforms.